The history of professional wrestling is a story that deserves to be told time and time again, and we can catch a portion of that history with the LJN WWF Superstars lineup of toys that existed on store shelves between 1984 and 1989. Over the last number of years, I've assembled a compilation of videos detailing each of these individual years, and this video right now serves as one extended fan-made supercut or fan-made documentary that you can enjoy. So let's look back at the history right now. The beauty of vintage toys is that it taps into the imaginations of grown adults living their best childhood memories. In the case of wrestling, that not only meant having the figures, but also late nights sitting on the couch watching old MTV specials that began in 1984 or the semi-regular NBC series known as Saturday Night's Main Event that began in 1985. Now, as far as booking your favorite matches from the comfort of your bedroom or your living room went, the history of wrestling toys is a checkered one at best. The Toys That Made Us Season 3 documentary episode chronicles the positional jockeying for the World Wrestling Federation figure license between now defunct toy companies Remco as well as Galoob before ultimately landing with LJN in 1984. LJN had previously worked on toy lines based on popular intellectual properties such as E.T., Magnum P.I., Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and also eventually released toys based on Indiana Jones as well as Thundercats. The world of professional wrestling would make a fine addition to LJN's star-studded lineup of figures. Unfortunately, the 8-inch scale figures lacked any articulation, aside from being able to bend the rubbery material ever so slightly, a choice that was made when the manufacturer decided against putting flexible wiring inside a figure of this size. And although this resulted in virtually zero action feature gimmick, the vibrant colors, expressive nature, and bulky size of these figures still made for lots of playful fun. Stay tuned, because this is the story of LJN's WWF Superstars, Series 1 of 1984. While this opening series saw the emergence of Vince McMahon's WWE or WWF at the time on the pegs and shelves of toy aisles, only nine figures were made in this first year, with the vast majority of the talent roster being saved for subsequent releases. Of course, since he had won the world title in the early part of 1984 and became the poster boy of the rock and wrestling movement that dominated this area, Hulk Hogan was released in this first wave along with his championship belt. He had won the title from the Iron Sheik, who Hulk not only feuded with at live events, but also in a short-lived Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling cartoon series that ran from 1985 to 86 that happened to feature many characters from this initial 1984 wave of figures. I do think that the cheerful expression of the Series 1 Hogan figure draws a lot from the rock and wrestling cartoon. While the figure is iconic and a must-have for even the most casual LJ and WWF collector, the paint rubs off of the knees a little too easily, and it's hard to find one in super mint condition. As far as the figure proportions go though, he's a bit skinnier than I would expect from a line of jacked up, bulky figures, and I actually personally prefer his Series 5 appearances in either the white or red shirt that has a more fierce demeanor on his face. Having said that, the yellow trunks and boots match his more common television and pay-per-view appearances, so for that reason alone, I can see collectors being drawn to this figure. Hey, it's certainly staying on my shelf. Hogan would go on to headline the first nine WrestleManias in some way, shape, or form, spanning five world title reigns and defeating opponents such as the likes of King Kong Bundy, Andre the Giant, Macho Man Randy Savage, and Sergeant Slaughter. If you're new to this series of figures and could have your pick of any figure to start your run, I'm sure many people would pick Hulk Hogan first. Now, among the wrestlers the people seem to talk less about these days is the one-time protege of Hulk Hogan, none other than the friendly hillbilly known as Hillbilly Jim. A relatable character due to his overalls and his catchy country music theme song, Jim spent most of his time in the mid-card scene, but was a fun act of sorts who was presented as being carefree and not active in the more serious storylines. The WWE also presented him as being part of a family with relatives such as Uncle Elmer, but if I'm being honest, none of them connected with the audience the same way that Hillbilly Jim did. Mine is in pretty good condition paint-wise, and he's one of the few figures that comes with an accessory, i.e. his signature hat that he would take to the ring with him. And while he never reached the booming heights of some of the other stars of the 1980s, Hillbilly Jim was a reliable mainstay during this period, and eventually returned in the mid-90s as a manager for the Godwin Cousins during the WWE's New Generation run. He would also make quick appearances in gimmick battle royals as a fun throwback act. And while we're on the subject of friendly characters, let's talk about the friendly giant of this era and, well, 
Okay, uh, first let's address this face scan. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love Andre the Giant, the eighth wonder of the world, as much as the next guy, and I know scanning technology of the 80s isn't what it is today, but the likeness feels just a little too far off compared to some of the other characters. But thankfully they got much closer with his Series 2 and Series 6 figures. It's just kind of obvious that they didn't try too hard for this one. But hey, the innocence of toys from this era still allows me to enjoy this figure nonetheless. Alright, so back on track. Prior to his famous heel turn in 1987, Andre was beloved by the fans through the 1970s and through the mid-1980s. When Hogan won the title in 1984, Andre was among the first to congratulate him, spraying champagne all over him in a celebratory manner in a cheerful post-match aftermath. And I think he got a little bit of that champagne on Mean Gene Okerlund as well. And while he's slightly less remembered for this era of his career than he was later on, it is notable that he, since he was more mobile during this era, he was able to throw drop kicks, which is impressive for a man of his size, as he was younger and more durable prior to the back surgery, which limited his movements later on. Simply put, there are no words that can put into context what Andre did as far as being a backstage leader to the boys goes. He was a respected and beloved individual by all, and he couldn't exactly go to public places without being noticed due to his sizable appearance. As such, he was pretty much forced to live the wrestling life 24-7, and he's been sorely missed since his passing in 1993. On the subject of beloved characters, here is the Junkyard Dog. Now, after moving from the NWA territories to the World Wrestling Federation in 1984, JYD had the perfect charisma and gimmick to fit right in with the other stars of this era. A strong babyface, he was known for bringing people in attendance into the ring to dance with him after he would win a match giving himself a charming nature and being a fun attraction of sorts. He did have some good mid-card feuds and appeared at the early WrestleManias, but I personally see a missed opportunity in the dog, as he does strike me as someone who could have succeeded in the main event scene rather than just playing second fiddle to the top superstars during this period. All that considered, none of this sours my memory of the smiling, collar-wearing, chain-carrying, fun-loving JYD. You will notice that my figure has the collar, but the chain is absent. That's okay, as I may be able to track one down sometime. His four-year initial run with the WWE means that his peak years actually coincided with those of the peak years of the LJN release of figures, and thus, here he is. He did also spend some time in WCW later on in his career. As we move along with other colorful characters of this golden period, who could ever forget? Superfly, Jimmy Snuka. I'll start right away with the most famous moment of his career when he leapt off of the 15 foot high steel cage onto Don Morocco during the events of an October 1983 show, a highlight that has been played over and over throughout the decades. And because he was already over 40 years old by the time of the true golden years of this wrestling period, I often wonder if this held back his ability to be pushed up higher on the card. Having said that, he was in Mr. T and Hulk Hogan's corner for the inaugural WrestleMania, so his supporting role in the main event of this historic landmark show is cemented in the annals of history. It was cool to see him feuding with Rowdy Roddy Piper or Cowboy Bob Orton during these years before he took a couple years to wrestle elsewhere, before returning again to the WWE for a stint between 1989 and 1993. Superfly does have the somewhat dubious achievement of being The Undertaker's first opponent at a WrestleMania, which of course kicked off Taker's extended undefeated streak at the Showcase of the Immortals. Whatever the case, Jimmy Snuka's place in wrestling history is indeed immortalized. As for the top villains of this era, let's look at the Hot Rod himself, Rowdy Roddy Piper. A man who needs absolutely no introduction, Piper was all about the wrestling business, including protecting it. He was the first guy to demand respect for the industry when he felt that an outsider like Mr. T was coming in to capitalize on the hype of the first WrestleMania. Whether he was right or wrong, you can never argue that Piper stood for what he believed in. Often showing up with his bodyguard, the ace cowboy Bob Orton, Roddy Roddy Piper showcased himself pretty much as the top heel of the WWF during these early years. His Piper's pit segments often made for the start of many feuds, whether he was picking a fight with the aforementioned Jimmy Snuka or betraying his former friend Paul Orndorff, who was his tag team partner during WrestleMania 1. No matter what he did though, it's hard to think of Piper as anything less than an icon of wrestling. For me, personally, because I came into wrestling closer to the late 1980s, I remember Piper as a smiling babyface with longer hair, sticking up for other good guys, and even serving as a color commentator with Gorilla Monsoon. Though, whether he was a heel or whether he was a babyface, he always sported his signature kilt. He became actually pretty iconic for that as well, and even years later, Ronda Rousey would sport a similar kilt and an attire as tribute to Roddy Piper. 
Don't lose the kilt though for this LJN figure. It's a somewhat expensive piece to track down if you don't find him complete. Though, if your figure doesn't have the kilt, well, whatever, just toss him in the ring and have him ring ready for one of your matches. And while Piper may have been the more famous villain of this period, we need to talk about the Iron Sheik, probably one of the more well-known transitional champions, meaning a guy who only holds the belt for a short period as a placeholder until the long-term champion is ready, the Sheik held the title for about a month after defeating Bob Backlund in late 1983 before dropping it to Hulk Hogan, who of course went on to carry the belt for four straight years thereafter. The Sheik was probably most well known for swinging his heavy Persian clubs, which was much harder than it looked, and it was revealed in a 2021 episode of WWE's Most Wanted Treasure that each club actually weighs 75 pounds, meaning it not only took a lot of strength to do it, but also incredible coordination for the Sheik to do what he did. He's also well known for his bitter rivalry with Sergeant Slaughter, which concluded in a boot camp match before he went on to team with Nikolai Volkov for an extended period. Managed by Freddie Blassie, they had the tag team titles for several months, and come to think of it, the Sheik is for sure underrated when discussing wrestling's all-time greats, seeing as he held both the singles world title as well as a tag team title as part of his history. This is something I actually didn't even consider until it was about time to make this video. But hey, you learn something new every day, right? And since we're already on the subject, his tag team partner Nikolai Volkov was also released as part of this first wave. Originally portrayed as a villainous Russian, Volkov would often sing the Russian national anthem before matches with the Sheik standing to his side. As mentioned earlier, they had a tag team title run together and often proclaimed Iran and Russia as being number one in their eyes. After a while though, Volkov would find himself teaming with Boris Zukov and continued feuding with other tag teams in the WWE, be it against the Bushwhackers or the Powers of Pain or another team. But after a period of time, and like many of the heels during this era, Volkov became a fun-loving, smiling babyface, sporting now both the Russian flag as well as the American national flag on his entrance coat, he feuded with a newly healed Hearn Sergeant Slaughter some time later. Whatever the case, Volkov is certainly a recognizable character for this era of wrestling. If you say his name, to most people who watch during this period, they certainly will recognize him. As for the last, but certainly not least, character of this series, here's another big man, Big John Studd. A member of the Heenan family, Big John was the original big man of the Heenan family stable. John feuded with Andre the Giant and famously got slammed in the $15,000 Body Slam Challenge at WrestleMania 1, with Big John coming out on the losing end. This feud ran for quite some time, and it was notable for being one of the non-title related matches that people would love to come see anyway as a big time attraction. After all, who wouldn't want to see two giants square off with one another? Within this time frame, you'd often see Big John team up with fellow big man King Kong Bundy forming a core team of baddies to take on some of our favorite stars. He was also famously known for eliminating William the Refrigerator Perry during a WrestleMania 2 Battle Royal, though Perry got his revenge just moments later. Now an underrated moment, yet still a crowning achievement of Stud's career, was his win of the 1989 Royal Rumble. I have to admit when I watched this pay-per-view, I didn't expect him to come out as the winner, but it was good to see someone outside of the top two or three stars of the World Wrestling Federation at the time win this match. Well, that rounds out the nine figures that were released in this LJN WWF Wrestling Superstars line of figures in 1984. Certainly, those of you who grew up with these toys would have tons of memories booking various matches and feuds with your friends at school or at home for playtime later. And the great thing about the collecting hobby today, you can still book these matches right now. Any time a vintage toy line was met with all around praise and successful sales upon its first year of release, a sequel series in its second year was almost always a guarantee. And during the glory days of the 1980s Saturday morning cartoons, we most certainly saw the launch of one successful toy line after another, year after year, resulting in a colorful, enjoyable, and timeless era of action figure products. The year 1985 represented a landmark 12-month cycle in the history of professional wrestling. The WWE, known as the WWF, or World Wrestling Federation at the time, had made the controversial choice to push its brand nationwide and eventually also distribute its product internationally as well. All of this went against the established agreement among old school wrestling promoters during this time period. What I mean by this for those who are not quite familiar is that wrestling had been segmented into region focused territories back in the old days, with individual promoters sticking to their assigned areas under an agreement with the governing National Wrestling Alliance 
or NWA. Having previously broken away from the NWA many years earlier, the WWF was treated as an independent organization but still largely seen in the wrestling industry as strictly being a Northeastern-based American territory. However, with the oncoming and progressively widespread availability of national cable coverage shifting the old ways of television distribution into what would become the new ways, the WWF elected to break regional boundary agreements. This resulted in their event schedule touring nationwide and distributing their product on the airwaves from coast to coast, a choice that resulted in the genesis of WrestleMania, the first of which was held in March of 1985. With all that backstory in mind, I feel I've set the stage for the climate of the wrestling culture at this time. As such, I'll be revisiting the action figures that were dominant during the same calendar year and explore the sophomore season of the rubberized LJN WWF Superstar lineup of toys. Let's begin. While the initial 1984 wave consisted of an extended lineup of nine figures as detailed in the aforementioned Series 1 History video, 1985 Series 2 contained a smaller cast featuring just six characters. Namely, we've got Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, George the Animal Steel, King Kong Bundy, the tag team of Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine, and the first character to see a second release, Andre the Giant, now with his shorter-haired appearance. And to directly market some of these characters, we had the aforementioned closed-circuit style events like WrestleMania, but we also had primetime programming such as the inception of Saturday Night's Main Event in the spring of 1985, and also episodes of Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling cartoon series that would debut in the fall of 1985. Now, as we look at the character lineup, beginning with the big man himself, I will point out that this appearance of Andre the Giant has a far more accurate look to the human being himself by comparison to his Series 1 1984 figure. I'm not quite sure what prompted the change, but I can only say that I am happier with this version of the character in the short trunks and before his days as a heel in the black singlet. I can honestly also say that I immediately think of his Body Slam Challenge match at the aforementioned WrestleMania 1, as well as the following year's WrestleMania Battle Royal, which would see the big man successful in this match as well. Either way, Andre the Giant is a cornerstone piece to any old school wrestling collection representing the glory days of the 1980s. I will note that the paint on my figure has seen better days, but I did have a strangely hard time tracking this particular figure down, so I'm just happy to have it in any case. 1985 also saw a pivotal year for a man who was both an arch rival and eventually an ally of Hulk Hogan, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff. Together with Rowdy Roddy Piper and Cowboy Bob Orton, they would team up to take on the Hulkster and friends at the inaugural WrestleMania, a loss that would see the split in tag team between Orndorff and Piper. I've always personally felt that Paul Orndorff, with his incredible strength and physique, was a bit underrated even in this era of wrestling. Now, while he was generally a legit main eventer at this time, I found that he was sometimes not given the spotlight he deserved due to being seen as something of a support character to the likes of Hogan, Piper, Andre, or Macho Man Randy Savage. Moving on, while we did get a tag team in the inaugural year of LJN's WWF superstars, namely Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik, this second year would see the tandem release of Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine, aka the Dream Team, who were both released as part of this wave. This of course was all before Brutus Beefcake eventually was known in his more popular barber gimmick and teaming with Hulk Hogan, and also for Valentine in his case, it was before his days as a team with the Honky Tonk Man. Note that Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine's manager, Johnny Valiant, wouldn't see a release until Series 5 later down the line. As for filling an attraction of sorts in the mid-card scene, who could ever forget the turnbuckle-eating Man Savage himself, George the Animal Steel. In an era where the characters were at their most colorful, cartoonish, and sometimes a little over the top, George's name is among those who spring to mind first. One interesting thing for me about George the Animal is, as a fan of wrestling, I tend to think more about his outlandish facial expressions, his over-exaggerated mannerisms, and his turnbuckle munching habits before thinking about any of the matches he was actually in. In fact, I can't even remember if he won more often than he lost, and most often just think of him as among the memorable characters 
who would otherwise fill out the timeless cast of WWF superstars during the 1980s. Rounding out the character wave of six figures during this 1985 year was King Kong Bundy, a natural heel and member of the famed Heenan family stable, Bundy was yet another one of those immovable objects in the ring who would give a hard time to the good guys that we were meant to cheer for. Now it wouldn't be until 1986 that we would see King Kong Bundy in the main event of the second ever WrestleMania with the Hulkster, but the sight of Bundy inside this steel cage is a key memory that I often associate him with, along with the tag team matches where he'd find himself teamed up with fellow Heenan family stable member Big John Studd. This second year would also see the release of the much needed Slingum Flingum Wrestling Ring. Now at the time of this video, I no longer have one of these in my collection and if I knew I was going to be making this video, I probably would have kept my previous one a little longer, at least until this video would be filmed. The key thing with the wrestling ring is that it gave us a permanent setting to host our events and play match booker in the comfort of our own homes. The addition of the solid blue steel cage accessory for main event matches is another nice touch to add to this playset. Also, if you want to know more about the Slingum Flingum wrestling ring and steel cage, have a look at my top 10 playsets countdown list on my channel's back catalog. Spoiler alert, I do talk about this ring and cage in some way, shape, or form, but I suppose with my love of pro wrestling, this won't come as a shock to anyone. In any case, this series of figures represents LJN not just opening the doors to a new toy line, but a year where they really hit the ground running. Now when we look at the cast of characters here, it is mostly memorable guys that don't quite have the exact star power of a Hulk Hogan or a Rowdy Roddy Piper, though we are getting a second release of Andre the Giant here. Similarly, the figures here don't have the perpetually hard to find exorbitant prices of the very last series in 1989 that would be issued. All that being said, this lineup of colorful characters in my opinion is necessary for fleshing out any desirable 1980s lineup. And like any of the figures in this overall series, the toys here are not articulated at all, mostly being reliant on the iconic style poses and being durable in nature compared to the more fragile figures of the same era. What I am saying overall is that while I appreciate the Series 2 1985 grouping that LJN released, I do see these guys more as augmentation to the main characters on my shelf. All the while, I've noted the pivotal nature and landscape of 1985 as a year where the wrestling industry saw some seismic business-wide changes and a shift in commercialized product that I mentioned in the earlier part of this video. Now, as viewers of this channel, let me know in the comments section, did you own any of these figures in your youth, or did you track them down later as an adult, or do you just like enjoying them from afar through the eyes of your fellow collector? Either way, let me know. Three years in, and three years left to go. 1986 represented the annual cycle that followed the first WrestleMania the prior year, but before the World Wrestling Federation had hit the true peak of its golden era with a third WrestleMania that would occur the following year. But in this go-round of releases, what did the WWF Wrestling Superstars toy line made by LJN have to offer? Let's travel back in time to the vintage era of toys once again, right here on Toy Connection. While Vincent Kennedy McMahon had purchased the World Wrestling Federation four years earlier, prior to the events of 1986, the company was just hitting its stride as an accepted form of televised entertainment on both a nationwide as well as international scale. Yes, the territory system of region-focused wrestling was still being grandfathered in by rival promotions. However, the writing was clearly on the wall, and it was obvious that the McMahon-owned wrestling empire was headed to the top of the wrestling mountain. What with a majestic cast of superstars, an unmatchable touring schedule, and its highly anticipated series of televised events. Sure, the first WrestleMania was considered as a successful closed circuit event in the days before pay-per-view wrestling spectacles. The WWF form of wrestling was also broadcast either on TV syndication or with specialty shows airing on both MTV and NBC, among others. As for the second WrestleMania that occurred in April of 1986, it is definitely less memorable than the extravaganza that preceded it the prior year, as well as the follow-up mega-spectacle that would occur the year after. 
Sure, on paper, it was exciting. An event airing in three locations spread across three hours was both ambitious as well as intriguing. Mr. T would square off with Rowdy Roddy Piper in the first hour's main event that emanated from New York. A wrestling football battle royal, along with a tag team championship match, served as the attraction for the second hour that took place in Chicago. And of course, a steel cage match pitting Hulk Hogan against King Kong Bundy in the third hour would headline as well as cap off the entire event. And while reactions were mixed and in many cases underwhelming, the same cannot be said for the amazing expanded lineup of figures that were released in this year. A jaw-dropping 17 figures were released in 1986, which comprises a greater number of figures than the combined 1984 and 1985 lineups in the two preceding years. Confidence in the line was clearly rising, and this third series roster is headlined by none other than the Macho Man Randy Savage. This was an earlier figure before his true rise to fame later on in the 1980s, but many consider this as the quintessential and cornerstone of any Macho Man action figure collection. He is posed in a way where he can deliver an elbow smash on either side of his body, and variants of him do exist with different shades of wrestling tights, as well as versions that have either stars or no stars decorated on his attire, and he'd be joined in toy form by his manager Miss Elizabeth in the following year of the LJN WWF Superstars series. And though this was before their timeless epic WrestleMania 3 rivalry and matchup, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat would be amongst the figures released in this wave. This did represent the very early days of the Dragon's career in the WWE or WWF at the time, having just recently jumped over from Jim Crockett Promotions. You'll notice that Steamboat is in his black wrestling attire rather than the more signature white or red tights that he'd wear later on. As many know, Steamboat would be a staple in the intercontinental title scene in the time following 1986. As a true sign of wrestling's popularity being on the rise during this time, this third series of toys showcased a significant number of non-wrestling personalities. Jesse the Body Ventura is shown here in his wrestling gear, though by this point you could pretty much count on him being at the announcer's booth more often than being an active participant in the ring. Variations do exist for Ventura, color-wise in terms of his hair, mustache, and tight colors. Even though this figure is clearly meant to be him in his active wrestling days, a lot of people's memories of him during this golden era is of Jesse calling the action with Vince McMahon or Gorilla Monsoon using his witty, creative, and charismatic style of commentary. Also joining the commentary booth in an on-again, off-again manner was Bobby the Brain Heenan. Truly in the prime of his career, we'll all remember him for managing the famed Heenan family stable, consisting of wrestlers ranging from the mid to upper card, and also while taking bumps while being known as the weasel he was. He's certainly one of the more desirable and memorable figures of this range. Mean Gene Okerlund also joined the broadcast crew, naturally as an interviewer who was well loved by his peers and fans. No one will ever forget the charismatic, undersized Mean Gene as a true iconic character of this era. He's known for his great personality, and not just for holding the microphone. In fact, he even got into the ring on the extremely rare occasion. As one can see, non-wrestlers were a staple of this third series of LJN WWF wrestling superstars. Captain Lou Albano was a big part of this rock and wrestling era, what with his friendship with Cyndi Lauper, as well as his engaging personality and unforgettable appearance. He'd be joined by others such as classy Freddie Blassie, who was known for managing the ultra heel tag team of the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov while carrying his signature cane with him everywhere. And I guess carrying a cane was something several managers would do to add to the colorful nature of their ringside personas, seeing as Mr. Fuji would do the same. Fuji, like many other managers, would have a career that spanned well into the 1990s as he'd always be a candidate to manage the big names and mega heels of wrestling history. Note that a lot of these non-wrestling personalities would also have variations on their figures, much like the wrestlers themselves. In the case of Bobby Heenan, his shoulder paint design would vary depending on the figure you got. Captain Lou would have some color variations on his shirt, and Mean Gene's microphone could be found with or without the WWF logo on it. And of course, who could ever forget the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. 
primarily a heel manager who occasionally would do a face turn, he wasn't a member of the Hart family, but since he carried the right last name, he did manage them in their rise to fame, among many other tag teams. Of course, the Mouth of the South would carry his megaphone everywhere. The LJN figure has his megaphone as a molded prop in his hand that had several variations in decoration and design, depending on which version you got. Moving on, while Hulk Hogan was the poster boy for the rock and wrestling movement of the mid-1980s, the World Wrestling Federation's first true household name was Bruno San Martino. Yes, his heyday was during the 1960s and 1970s as the top star for Vince McMahon Sr., aka the father of Vincent Kennedy McMahon, who would take wrestling's broadcasting power to an international level. Bruno still had quite a level of star power left by the 1980s, hence why this figure is an important one. An easy choice to induct into the WWE's Hall of Fame, Bruno will always be remembered for his endless world title reign which ran for seven and a half years when he defeated Nature Boy Buddy Rogers in the spring of 1963 and dropping the belt shortly after the start of 1971. Do note that Bruno's prominent years were back when the promotion was still called the World Wide Wrestling Federation before the third W was dropped from WWWF in an acronym that would be just WWF after this. And speaking of big stars, the mid-1980s would see the rise of a timelessly amazing tag team in the British Bulldogs. Davy Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid would actually win the world tag team titles in this 1986 calendar year before ceding the belts the following year to the Hart Foundation. Brought over from Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling, the Dynamite Kid was one of the biggest influences and inspirations to wrestlers in the decades that would follow, what with his smooth style of wrestling mixed with his high-flying nature. Davy Boy would later adopt the British Bulldog name as a singles wrestler, becoming a powerhouse of a superstar who would also see a ton of singles success both as an intercontinental champion as well as a European champion during the 1990s. The two men were related as real-life cousins and both were related as in-laws to the great Bret the Hitman Hart. Few tag teams past or present were better or more dominant than the Bulldogs. Greatness does come in all forms and wrestling gimmicks and while he was known for being middle-aged and crazy for his most prominent wrestling years, Terry Funk was a memorable part of this year's wrestling lineup as well. Carrying a branding iron for parts of his career, Terry did team with other members of the Funk family and was also on the undercard of the aforementioned WrestleMania 2 this year. He'd go on to be among the hardcore legends of wrestling history. And while many will remember Jimmy Snuka's 1983 leap off the cage to rally the crowd at Madison Square Garden, some have forgotten that the recipient of that splash was the original rock himself, Don Morocco. Morocco would be managed by the aforementioned Mr. Fuji for parts of his career, and he would be a much-hated heel feuding with the likes of Snuka as well as Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. He'd also be in the main event of the first ever Survivor Series during 1987 as a member of Hulk Hogan's team. Another relatively large name during this era was none other than Tito Santana. In fact, Santana was the intercontinental title holder going into this 1986 calendar year, a belt he would cede to the Macho Man Randy Savage in the latter's build-up to becoming a big megastar. Santana did have multiple intercontinental and world tag team title runs during the 1980s, being a reliable mid-card act. Rounding out the 1986 LJN Wrestling Superstar Series 3 cast were a couple of wrestlers who some may have forgotten, but their names are very much entrenched in wrestling history. Here's Corporal Kirshner, who at one point was used as enhancement talent, even if he does hold a key victory over Nikolai Volkov at this particular year's WrestleMania 2. Kirshner comes in his clean-shaven variant, as well as his rarer bearded variant. Then of course their special delivery Jones who could be found in two different colored attire variations as well. SD Jones did have the dubious achievement of losing in a record time to King Kong Bundy in the first ever WrestleMania the prior year, but Jones was known as a company workhorse, wrestling a ton of matches every single year and is among the names inducted into the WWE's Hall of Fame like so many others in this video. Wrestling and wrestling collectible toys by extension have had their shares of ups and downs, but it's safe to say that this 1986 year was more good than bad and to think the World Wrestling Federation was still trending upwards towards its peak years. The entertainment industry is full of memorable moments. Whether it's film, music, classic sitcoms, sports, or some combination of the above, timeless images of entertainment history are forever entrenched in our memories. 
Mention the World Wrestling Federation or World Wrestling Entertainment if you prefer, and among the first events people will recall is the slam heard round the world at WrestleMania 3 back in 1987. Those who were alive and watching the spectacle can tell you where they were at the time. Those who watched it after can probably tell you their immediate reaction and starstruck feeling that surrounded the entire event. Even those who were born after this are aware of the night that the irresistible force met the immovable object. And while multiple toys representing Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant would be released in years other than the one we're going to be talking about today, it's worth noting the extended cast of characters of this year that comprise the action figure lineup to help you build a roster around these two iconic wrestlers. The superstar choices to make it into toy form this year did a lot to flesh out the existing ensemble group established by the three previous release years, not to mention giving more options to create your own supercard selection of matches for your living room and backyard playtime adventures. While the large size nature of these figures made it difficult to do crossovers with other popular toy lines at the time, there's no denying it did make them stand out on store pegs when you shopped for toys with your mom and dad. And whether you have your own memories of this year or you're learning about it after the fact, either way, it's time for another Toy Connections history video. With that, let's dive in and talk about this particular part of toy history. So it's time once again to tag me in and ring that bell because this is the story of LJN's WWF wrestling superstars in the year of 1987. While it's hard to argue that the pinnacle sports entertainment moment in 1987 was indeed WrestleMania 3, there was still lots to talk about aside from this milestone evening of an event and the monumental attendance at the Pontiac Silverdome back in March of this particular year. This year also saw the inception of the Survivor Series in November, beginning an annual tradition that still runs strong to this day. And Jim Crockett Promotions still held events year-round, serving as the only regional territory of the now floundering National Wrestling Alliance capable of providing some form of competition to Vince McMahon and his rapidly expanding wrestling empire. Indeed, WWF merchandise was anywhere and everywhere, and wrestling had gotten to the point where several superstars were becoming a brand unto themselves within an increasingly popular sports entertainment genre. And along with merchandise comes the usual influx of toys. And in the case of LJN's wrestling superstars, this meant yet another wave of larger scale, rugged and rubbery figures stylized after your favorite WWF superstars. At first glance, you'll see the increased number of figures. A trend started a year earlier in 1986 as the character selection had been broadened compared to the previous smaller rosters of 1984 and 1985. Perhaps it was a celebration of the rising dominance of his wrestling business or pure coincidental timing, but WWF owner and promoter Vince McMahon was among those to receive an action figure this year. While it wasn't public knowledge yet that Vince was the owner, he was frequently seen hosting WWF branded events as a ringside announcer. And combined with Jesse the Body Ventura released the prior year, you had a full commentary crew to call your matches for your fantasy booking purposes. Also, we can reasonably state that commentator and interviewer type of figures were probably less popular to kids since they didn't make sense to bash around as wrestlers. But trust that figures such as Vince have seen a significant spike in price in recent years amongst collector circles. Having said that, LJN's WWF Superstars was no stranger to adding supporting characters to the wrestlers who took center stage. From that perspective, it only made sense to see a release of the first lady of wrestling, Miss Elizabeth, in this year. Commonly appearing with her gold skirt release, she also came in a much rarer and now more expensive purple skirt appearance. Hardcore collectors will obviously want both versions, but any way you slice it, having a manager for the ever popular Macho Man Randy Savage just made sense, as they are among the most iconic pairings not just in wrestling, but in pop culture history as a whole. Then of course you've got my favorite wrestler of all time, a well-known Canadian hero in Bret the Hitman Hart, as well as his brother-in-law, Jim the Anvil Neidhart. Released both individually and later on in a two-pack, it's only fitting to put the tag team title belts on these two, seeing as 1987 was the year that they won these belts for the first of two title runs. It should also be noted that the Hart Foundation did come in multiple variants with both lighter as well as darker colored ring tights. Brett would go on to have a legendary career with an endless amount of matches, becoming one of the most decorated wrestlers in history. 
Jim the Anvil would also see a career resurgence in the 1990s as the two aligned themselves with the second incarnation of the Hart Foundation and another generation of Hearts would form many years later with the Hart Dynasty. I could go on, but what I'm trying to say is that the legacy of the Hart Foundation began here with this tag team and by and large with this initial title run in this year. The tag teams were doubly well represented this year with Brian B. Blair and Jumping Jim Brunzel as the Killer Bees. Their colorful and gimmicky nature speaks to the way WWE was programmed back in the day such that attires like these were considered a good idea in the wrestling mid-card scene back then. Like the Heart Foundation, the Killer Beast also had multiple variants, with some having darker skin tones than others. And since we did talk about the wrestling territories just a moment ago, here's Harley Race. Going by his king gimmick and sporting the pricey crown that is hard to get on the secondary market, this figure represents Harley in the late stages of his career when he was still a big name in the industry, albeit now hanging out with the Heenan family stable. While his prime years mostly occurred in the AWA as well as touring the National Wrestling Alliance, it was great to see Harley Race get a figure here during his active career before his wrestling days were over. And even though the mid-card scene was the primary focus of this particular year of LJ and WWF superstars, there were still a few who became household names despite not being consistently pushed at the top of the WWE's roster. Among the best examples of this is Jake the Snake Roberts, known for his intense promos, his devastating DDT finisher, and of course, his pet snake Damien, Jake didn't get the same opportunity to main event at WrestleMania like Hulk Hogan or Macho Man Randy Savage. But say his name to literally anyone who knows anything about wrestling and they'll be more than likely to tell you that they remember this man very, very well. And also among those who hung out with the main eventers and got to share some of that spotlight as early as the first WrestleMania is Cowboy Bob Orton. Being good friends with Rowdy Roddy Piper and Paul Mr. Wonderful Orndorff in his early years, Cowboy Bob may be a legend, but today his son Randy Orton is as big a name as any and has exceeded his father's legacy. My version of Cowboy Bob doesn't have his hard to find hat, but maybe that'll change someday. Either way, he's yet another on the list of wrestlers with memorable gimmicks and personalities during this all too great and golden era of professional wrestling. I mentioned the heels a moment ago, and yet another member of the Heenan family faction is a powerhouse of a man in Hercules Hernandez. I don't really think that this is a great representation of him, because when you compare this to historic photographs of him, he doesn't often look or dress this way. Having said that, when you only had a single option for a figure back then, you'll find ways to justify putting it into your collection. Of course, what Heenan family is complete without the mighty Hercules? And also a different kind of powerhouse also made a name for himself in this era. The Uganda giant, Kamala. Another star of the wrestling territories, Kamala was branded as a savage beast of a man, someone who could even stand toe to toe with the awesome power of Hulkamania in the ring once he joined the WWE and serve as a giant heel that felt rewarding when the good guys got a victory over him. He'd be managed by Slick at times during his career and despite his struggles later on in life, Kamala's prime years are forever entrenched in our memories as a staple of 80s wrestling. And while Jake the Snake had his pet Damien, who could ever forget the Birdman Coco Beware? With his flamboyant attire, his catchy theme music, and his epic bird that they'd call Frankie, the Birdman seemed to alternate between being a successful WWE mid-card act or being used as an enhancement talent to make other stars look better. Either way, he added a high level of charisma to the WWE roster, be it in the 80s or early 90s. Now, some may remember him and some may not, but Olympic weightlifter and strongman turned pro wrestler Ken Patera was also among the WWE's roster at this time. I don't have a ton of memories of Ken Patera, but the one thing he'll forever be known for is being on Hulk Hogan's team at the inaugural Survivor Series, taking on the likes of Andre the Giant and other iconic bad guys of the 80s. You may notice that my collection is missing a few members of this famed 1987 LJN WWF Superstars cast, notably adorable Adrian Adonis, Billy Jack Haynes, Ted Arcidi, and Outback Jack. The reason for that is I don't consider myself a full-on completist when it comes to collecting these vintage wrestling superstars figures. My memory of these wrestlers varies depending on the event, and I tend to remember them more when I'm in the moment 
watching an old event via streaming services. But if you are a completist of old school WWF LJN figures, I definitely recommend getting all of these characters. Now while that may cover the cast of official releases as far as this Series 4 of LJN's Wrestling Superstars is concerned, 1987 also brought about another figure that most people would want to have to make your Wrestling Superstars experience feel even more complete. That's right, an 8 inch tall Sergeant Slaughter perfectly scaled and posed in the LJN style was released by Hasbro in 1987 as a mail away offer that was normally saved for their 3 and 3 quarter inch G.I. Joe a Real American Hero brand of figures. As the story goes, Sarge was a big name in the World Wrestling Federation in 1984, matched in popularity probably only by Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. However, signing a deal to appear as a G.I. Joe character as early as 1985 meant the end of Sarge as a WWF personality and character for the time being. Note that this figure is made of a more rigid plastic material rather than the rubbery style LJN figures that were typical of the time. And while he wouldn't go back to work for Vince McMahon again until 1990, Hasbro saw a good opportunity to capitalize on sales and make this figure, which is now considered a holy grail, not to mention a highly priced and highly prized figure. But this of course makes 1987 all the more special, seeing as both my favorite wrestler of all time in Bret Hart and the crossover G.I. Joe and wrestling icon got released in this scale and style in the same year. No, it's not technically branded nor endorsed as an LJN WWF Superstars official product, but many collectors in the wrestling fandom very much consider it part of their list of must-have figures. And by extension, it can unofficially be classified as a Series 4 figure given the year it was released. I also happen to have a copy of his mail-away form, albeit this one being a Canadian form that actually has the Canadian office address at the time to mail away and get the figure from. Needless to say, it was a good time to be a wrestling fan, and this series of toys came during a time when sports entertainment was just ramping up. In other parts of the boys' targeted toy industry, 1987 represented a year where Masters of the Universe would see a decline. Both Transformers and G.I. Joe would see the end of their original television runs in North America, and this was a gap in time before Turtle Power would hit the airwaves literal weeks before 1987 was over. Of course, LJN Wrestling Superstars would carry on for another year in 1988, and yet another year in 1989 that would see itself transition to the much smaller Grand Toys to carry the final wave of Wrestling Superstars figures when LJN's toy division was shut down. Either way, the legacy of these iconic rubberized wrestling representations is firmly entrenched as part of toy history. The wonderful thing about wrestling is seeing all the colorful and expressive personalities involved and knowing that these characters have stood the test of time such that both new and old wrestling fans still talk about them to this day. As such, it was a pleasure to dive in, not only to discuss the topic of LJN wrestling figures this year, but also to discuss the key moments in the WWF that occurred during this time as well. And regardless if you're still a wrestling fan today or if you bowed out of watching this brand of entertainment years ago, you can always look back at these toys and be reminded of the feel-good, innocent days of wrestling's past. After all, it's the stars of the past that paved the way for the stars of the present and future. It's without question that the latter portion of the 1980s would feature professional wrestling as a globally accepted form of entertainment. With that, the year 1988 would see a year-round schedule of WWF pay-per-views supplemented by the broad selection of network specials. This calendar year would also see a timeless assortment of characters for the LJN-produced Wrestling Superstars toy line. This would actually be LJN's final year making this line of figures and was the second last year of seeing these figures in production altogether. But what a lineup it was, and we can have a closer look at this cast of characters right here and now. Let's begin. 1988 was a transition year that would see LJN's last year in making the Wrestling Superstars figures, seeing as the 1989 set would migrate over to the much smaller Canadian-based Grand Toys Company. It is worth noting as a whole though that 1988 saw seismic shifts and changes in the boys' targeted action figure industry. The globally viral Transformers would see their final shortened cartoon season in the United States during 1987, focusing their animation efforts overseas with Japanese voice acting and Japanese episodes in 1988, along with the more gimmick-heavy toys that were still reasonably popular on store shelves. 
G.I. Joe Real American Hero would see an animated film in 1987 but would close up shop on this front until Deke launched the series again in 1989. Note though that the late 1980s would see more focus on G.I. Joe subteams rather than characters in their more well-known Sunbow and Marvel comic appearances. By comparison, Mattel's Masters of the Universe saw a bigger fiscal drop in 1987 compared to the other two aforementioned boys-targeted toy brands. They featured a live-action film in 1987 but needed a more wholesale change with the new adventures of He-Man toy line that ran from 1989 through to the early 1990s. Of course, Turtle Power dominated the airwaves non-stop in 1988, shifting the global phenomenon amongst the young male demographic to four amphibious heroes along with their allies and villains while the previous big three of the 1980s would play second fiddle. And yes, for live entertainment, the movie, television, and also music industries would give us some timeless classics during this period, but it's no doubt that wrestling was a big part of this entertainment boom. Of course, a lot of people would remember Hulk Hogan's controversial loss to Andre the Giant as part of the February 1988 episode of The Main Event. This episode remains famous to this day for the incredible 15.2 Nielsen TV rating that it drew, reported to be seen by 33 million households. The WWF pay-per-view schedule was also largely rounding into form by this time. The annual WrestleMania event featured a tournament for the vacated WWF Championship, we'd see the first ever SummerSlam with Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage teaming up to take on Andre the Giant and the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. And we get the second annual Survivor Series in the fall of this year, which would continue the tradition of team-focused matches. And while not officially considered a pay-per-view yet, the first ever Royal Rumble broadcast to audiences kicked off the 1988 calendar year that January. This featured a 20-man over-the-top rope match won by Hacksaw Jim Duggan before the event switched to being a 30-participant elimination match in the years it would follow. The World Wrestling Federation would air this particular Royal Rumble special on the USA Network opposite to the Jim Crockett Promotions bunkhouse stampede that was on pay-per-view that same night. Talk about the war for wrestling supremacy. Anyway, enough about the actual wrestling landscape in 1988, and let's talk about the actual LJN produced product in this year's lineup itself. Where else to begin but with the immortal Hulk Hogan? The red shirt and white shirt versions from this year have become a little more scarce and definitely highly desirable over the years. Notice that they are considerably bulkier in their stature compared to the lankier 1984 Series 1 release that came in his more signature colors, but to be honest, I prefer the more muscular look for this figure. Yes, 1988 would still be a year where Hogan was a big part of the World Wrestling Federation, but it was also when he took time off to film the cult classic No Holds Barred. That of course left the responsibility of world champion to the macho man Randy Savage. But either way you look at it, the fact that Hogan got three distinct figures in this 8-inch series of LJN Wrestling Superstars shows just how much of a leading frontman and icon Hogan was, and still is, in the wrestling industry. The aforementioned hacksaw Jim Duggan would also see a release this year, coinciding with the Royal Rumble victory that was a highlight of his career. This figure has grown more desirable over the years, much like others in this wave, being a later release, but also because of the easily lost 2x4 accessory that became synonymous with Jim Duggan over the decades. While never a fixture of the main event scene, Jim Duggan would always be a standout due to his light-hearted nature and because he would lead the USA chants in the ring as part of his American patriotism persona. This year of LJN Wrestling Superstars was also known as a year where some figures were not cast in the flesh color coming out of the factory, where normally the tights and other details would be painted on after the fact. Some figures in this year were actually cast in the same color as their wrestling gear or their entrance gear, with the flesh details painted on afterwards. This is why some of the figures look a little bit strange when the paint wears off, as can be seen in some of the images here. Amongst that, the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase was one of these figures, but as a character, he became a top heel by the late 1980s. In fact, he was awarded the WWF Championship the night Andre won the belt from Hogan and forfeited the belt to DiBiase, who, on screen, had purchased the belt from Andre. That being said, while images exist of him with the belt around his waist, this is not a recognized title reign in the WWE record books. 
DiBiase would go on to the finals of the WrestleMania 4 tournament in the spring of 1988, losing eventually to the Macho Man while having an incredible year all around, especially as he was also part of the main event of SummerSlam and Survivor Series that was mentioned earlier. Do note that the figure in this collection is quite worn and probably needs to be replaced at some point. Either way, the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase was well known for a lot of heelish tendencies during this golden era of pro wrestling. Thankfully though, the Bam Bam Bigelow figure in this collection is in far better condition than DiBiase, which is crucial for a figure like this that has a lot of painted details. Bam Bam did alternate between being both a heel as well as a face throughout his peak years. He was considerably agile for a big man, and while the mid-card scene was the usual placement on the card for Bam Bam, he was still pretty convincing when he was utilized as a main eventer from time to time. Another big man here, George Gray took on a few key personas throughout his wrestling career. Among them, there was the dancing big man known as Akeem who would team with the big boss man, but even before that, he was known as the one man gang. Notably, the Akeem gimmick was a big departure from the one man gang gimmick, at least cosmetically. The gang would often squash enhancement level talent, though he'd often find himself on losing end when going up against the big name main event babyfaces. It's notable though that he was the last man eliminated during that inaugurable televised Royal Rumble which Hacksaw Jim Duggan won, as mentioned earlier. This year also saw the lineup entry of a wrestler many consider as the greatest intercontinental champion of all time, the Honky Tonk Man. A 450 plus day title reign that spanned from 1987 through to 1988, Honky Tonk would lose in quick fashion to the Ultimate Warrior in SummerSlam of that year to end his impressive run as Intercontinental Champ. Known for smashing his guitar over the heads of a ton of popular baby faces, this Elvis lookalike is one of the first names you think of as far as wrestling is concerned, particularly during the late 1980s and early 1990s. He was quite versatile and could be used anywhere on the card, be it as a single star, a tag team star, and even as a manager later on in his career. The tag team scene also got some level of representation this year. In particular, the strike force of Rick Martel and Tito Santana were part of this wave. While you can still see Tito Santana as part of the previous LJN 1986 Series 3 set of releases, this one has him and Martel in their white trunks signifying their tag team. They became the tag champs as of late 1987 as a babyface team and would lose the belts during the calendar year of 1988 before officially splitting up by WrestleMania 5 the following year in 1989, which is when Rick Martel decided to turn heel and leave his partner mid-match in the center of the ring. Soon after, Martel would go on to adopt his Rick the Model Martel gimmick, while Santana would still continue to have a respectable singles run as well. And speaking of tag teams, Demolition's axe was part of this wave. If LJN series had continued through to the 1990s, I do wonder if Smash would have been included as well to complete the team. Demolition had three tag team title reigns between 1988 and 1990, primarily held by Axe and Smash, but Crush was later added to the group during the team's third title run. These Kiss Man lookalikes were definitely a staple of this era for pro wrestling. As for non-wrestling personalities, Johnny Valiant was added to this wave. He's often forgotten among the more popular managers of this era, but he did manage some names such as Dino Bravo, Brutus Beefcake, as well as Greg Valentine. And speaking of the other popular managers, the smooth-talking Slick was added to this year's lineup. With his signature top hat, Slick was amazing on the microphone, being amongst the charismatic, flamboyant managers of this era. He was often seen in the corner of significant tag teams like the Twin Towers, as well as Power and Glory, and the Uganda Giant, Kamala, among many others. Rounding out this year's lineup was the WWF Referee. Smaller in stature than pretty much everyone except for Mean Gene Okerlund in the entire LJN Wrestling Superstars toy line, the referee was found in either a blue or white shirt in terms of its variants. The referee was just left unnamed on his packaging, leaving the referee's identity to the imagination of young minds at the time of its release. Throughout this Wrestling Superstars series, you'll notice I haven't talked about the smaller, rubberized bendies figures that were released during this period, nor the thumb wrestler rubber figures. That's simply because the primary focus of LJN's wrestling lineup during this time clearly centered on their 8-inch series, and the smaller figures consisted of largely the same lineup of superstars anyway. Surely, there was a lot to love about wrestling in 1988, and as popular as it was, it's exciting to think about the fact that wrestling would continue to reach new heights after this period of time. 
Either way, it was a time when wrestling felt more cartoonish than the more reality-based eras that would come after this, and that innocent nature represents the true, perpetual charm associated with this time period. If you were a fan of old school wrestling, then you have certainly seen the rubberized WWF Superstars toy line that dominated toy store aisles in the 1980s. Originally released by LJN from 1984 to 1988 until they went out of business, the smaller company known as Grand Toys released the final six figures in 1989, only in Canada. Unlike their predecessors of the earlier years, these figures, along with re-releases of previous characters, were produced on black cards rather than blue ones. Also, due to their Canadian market exclusivity and the waning popularity of the Superstars toy line of figures, these final six toys were noticeably more rare and thus pricier than the figures that came before them. We have seen similar rareness and disproportionately booming prices in other toy lines before, particularly with Kenner's Star Wars line in their last 17 figures or with the Generation 1 Transformers figures that were only released in Europe or Japan. Wrestling is certainly no exception to this in the collectible figure market. Stay tuned, as this is the story of the final WWF Wrestling Superstars run of figures, 1989's Series 6. Known for being durable due to their thick rubbery material construction, the LJN Superstars line made for plenty of fun when kids bashed them together while mimicking their favorite wrestling matches. I personally remember seeing other kids bring these for show and tell sessions during preschool and kindergarten, and being impressed by their size and colorful aesthetic. The final six figures released under the Grand Toys banner consisted of Heenan family members Andre the Giant, Haku, and Ravishing Rick Rude. Joining them were Powers of Pain member the Warlord, Big Boss Man from the Twin Towers, and the legendary Ultimate Warrior, who himself would have a run at the top as a franchise-level megastar. As this collection was one of the more difficult ones for me to acquire all six, let's have a look at each release in this fabulous series. Now, whether you're a hardcore or a fair-weather wrestling fan, you have certainly heard of the eighth wonder of the world known as Andre the Giant. While the watershed moment of his career came in 1987 with the slam heard around the world against Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3, Andre's career actually goes all the way back to the 1960s. He went through several names and gimmick changes, actually being known more as a fan favorite rather than the heelish villain we saw at WrestleMania 3. A true giant diagnosed early in his life with acromegaly, or gigantism as it's also called, Andre is an icon and was the inaugural member into the WWE's Hall of Fame in 1993. Some of you may have seen his HBO documentary, or his A&E featured episode of Most Wanted Treasures. Actually, in that latter mentioned episode, it should be noted that Paul White, aka The Big Show, laid his own hand against the life-size x-ray of Andre the Giant's hand and Andre's fingers were noticeably longer, thus further showing how much of a literal giant he was. This Series 6 figure is actually the last one that I managed to get for my 1989 set, and it's in reasonably good condition. As I did get into wrestling after Andre had already turned heel, this is how I remember him, even if his earlier days and earlier figures depict him as a fan-loving babyface. Interestingly enough though, this figure is a bit smaller than his Series 1 and Series 2 release. As for the man who dishes out hard time on his opponents, the Big Boss Man was a fixture on WWE television during his early years. I'll remember the matches during the late 1980s on Saturday Night's main event or numerous pay-per-view appearances wielding his nightstick and prison guard outfit. Sadly though, my figure doesn't have his nightstick, but when I did purchase him from a local seller a while ago, he was in such immaculate condition that I couldn't pass him up. And while he did form a tag team with Akeem as part of the Twin Towers, we never did get an Akeem figure as part of this line. However, since Akeem was previously known as the One Man Gang, it's still feasible to pose them together and use a tiny bit of imagination to show off the once dominant tag team. The Big Boss Man would later split from his partner and begin a babyface run, where he memorably helped out Hulk Hogan at the 1990 SummerSlam by watching his back against Earthquake. And as for a figure that gets a bit of flack, here's the arrogant character known as Ravishing Rick Rude. With his hands posed in what many consider a kind of useless fashion, I do find that this makes for some hilarious photographs if you photograph him from behind. And even though I'm supposed to be more mature than this, I can't help but enact a scene where a drunk Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones has passed out and Ravishing Rick decides to urinate on Westeros' favorite dwarf. This Rick Rude figure is another one that's in great shape. A local buy from another vendor who I purchase from a few times a year. Hey, who could ever forget Rick Rude's famous feuds with Jake the Snake Roberts or the Ultimate Warrior? As he is the epitome of arrogance, 
Rude is famously known for not just talking down to opponents, but to fans at sold out arenas as well when he's showing off about his physique. I certainly love posing him with his fellow Heenan family stablemates, as he's one of the more memorable and famous heels in wrestling history. As for the third member of the Heenan family who got released this year, here's Haku from the Islanders tag team. Haku was a legit tough man who was known to be feared by the rest of the boys if he lost his temper. Haku spent most of his time in the mid-card scene, although he has made some appearances in both AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling when he manages his sons during matches. I have been fortunate to find him in good shape as well, just like the other figures in this set. And my favorite memory of Haku was when he and Andre the Giant lost the demolition in a tag match at WrestleMania 6, which I guess resulted in the fallout between Andre and the Heenan family. I also fondly remember Haku when he went to WCW later on, and he was renamed as Meng. I definitely like the dynamic way that this figure is naturally posed with his arms in the air like he's about to leap onto an opponent or celebrate a victory after a match. And if you've got a Harley Race figure with the crown, be sure to give it a try on Haku to emulate his days when he was called King Haku. And now let's have a look at the Warlord. Actually, among the final six figures that were released as part of this Wrestling Superstars toy line that we're talking about as the subject of this video, Warlord was the first one that I grabbed. When I saw his condition at a toy show some time ago, I just said, wow, I cannot pass this one up. Unfortunately, due to the abrupt end of this line, we only got to see the Warlord and his manager Mr. Fuji, with the Barbarian being absent from this series. However, the same seller who sold me this Warlord ended up finding a custom Barbarian figure later on, and thus I was all too thrilled to unite the powers of Pain Tag Team as a pair. As a collector, I'm actually more of a fan of photogenic group shots and iconic teams, more so than being a completist of every single figure, so having both members of this tag team is definitely a pleasure. The Warlord would later go on to have feuds with rising stars such as Davy Boy Smith, so if you happen to have the 1986 Series 3 version of Davy Boy, you can certainly emulate this feud. As for the awesome power of the Ultimate Warrior, here's his figure from the series and the last one that we're going to look at among the final six. The hair does have a little bit of paint scuffing, which is common among these releases, but that being said, it's minor enough that I am willing to overlook it for the purposes of my collection. The Ultimate Warrior as a character was certainly a jolt of adrenaline for wrestling fans during this time, including myself. His hard rock entrance and wild levels of energy while running to the ring, plus how he would shake the ropes uncontrollably once he got to the ring, gave him such an amazing presence on camera. The one thing that I do find pretty cool though is that the early 2000s Jax figure belts actually fit decently well on the LJN figures, and so I've got him sporting the Intercontinental title. While he did have some important matches with the likes of Andre, the Honky Tonk Man, or Rick Rude, the hallmark match of his career came against Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 6. Who could ever forget the Warrior holding both the world title and intercontinental title to a stunned crowd as being the man to dethrone Hulkamania in an emotionally charged bout. He'd have to follow up this performance a year later though with an equally amazing storied match with Macho Man Randy Savage in a career versus career match at WrestleMania 7. Kids certainly love to paint their faces in the same fashion as the Warrior, and I remember scouring the catalogs of old wrestling magazines as a kid, seeing merchandise such as t-shirts, foam fingers, the Wrestling Buddies doll, or action figures. It is arguable whether or not Andre or the Warrior would be the most iconic member of this final six wave, but the fact that we have both of them in this series adds to the overall desirability of this line of figures. And while the focus of this video has been on the rubberized LJN or Grand Toys figures, I do also have modern incarnations of these characters as part of the Mattel Elite series. And while that does allow me some additional posability and display options, one can never forget that the WWF or WWE figures began with these original large rubber constructed representations. Note as well that the spirit of these original LJN figures lives on, seeing as Jax did release figures in a similar style and AEW is doing the same going forward. And that was the complete history of LJN's WWF Wrestling Superstars. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and I welcome you to keep your eyes peeled for more Toy Connections video content in the future. Thanks for joining me on this extended episode and I'll see you next time. Take care.